Welcome to the Pittsburgh Dish. I'm your host, Doug Heilman. Want the inside scoop on some of our best food neighborhoods? This week's guest knows her stuff. Looking for that celebratory meal for that meat lover in your life? Our friend Raquel has just the place. And want a fun and retro sweet salad recipe that's easy to remember? We have one for you in our recipe of the week. All that ahead, stay tuned. We want to thank all of our listeners that have taken the step to support the Pittsburgh Dish. If you're finding value in what we're doing week over week, learning new places, hearing the stories of interesting people, or learning about a new recipe that you want to try at home, we'd love it if you would consider supporting the show as well. Just go to our website at www.pittsburghdish.com and look for the support button. You can sign up for as little as $3 a month and cancel anytime. Thanks so much for listening and supporting the Pittsburgh Dish. Now on to the show. Hey, so welcome to the show and thanks for coming over. I'm so happy to be here. Would you introduce yourself and what you have going on right now in food? A lot. Okay, so my name is Beth Kurtz-Taylor. I'm one of three owners of Third Space Bakery that will be opening this spring in Garfield. We will be a bakery by day, specializing in rustic French pastry and sourdough breads. Uh, We'll have lunch and breakfast items as well. But at night, we will convert to be a cooking classroom where you can come and take baking and cooking classes. I love it. Okay, so the bakery is opening this spring, but you and I got to know each other a couple years back uh, through, uh, I always like to say a kid's cooking camp. It's Mm -hmm. called Camp Delicious. Yes. Uh, How did you get involved in that? Um, So one of my business partners, Erica Bruce, she and I got to know each other through a cookbook club and um, she's a chef and a a pastry chef and she was approached to help run the, to run the camp. Mm -hmm. And she knew I had the experience of working with children and running a teaching kitchen. I worked for three years for YMCA of Greater Pittsburgh, running their kitchen in the Sampson um, family YMCA. And she asked if she could bring me on board as well. And the two of us collaborated to create the curriculum for two years and execute the camp with first year was 2021, which was, you know, the first post pandemic camp. So that was a little challenging. Yeah. And then the next year in 2022 is when you came along yeah. and, and joined us. I was so was scared. Great <laughs> I actually was so afraid to ask. I didn't want to be butting in, but I was just looking to do a little bit more mm. real life stuff as opposed to some things I was doing on social media. And you guys were A, so gracious and B, really put me to task. Oh I have yeah, to we did. Say, <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever make a mole no, again live, no. <laughs> but the kids are so amazing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, through that experience, I think it really raises everybody's confidence in the kitchen. Absolutely. It raised mine. Absolutely. I learned something mm-hmm. through you all. And, uh, and I also learned about your love of cookbooks. Um, so that's what, that's how I got introduced to you, but I'd love to take you a little bit back. Uh, I know you said you had really started a career in child development mm-hmm. and child education. Mm-hmm. Where did your, your journey into food really begin? Um, it's pretty funny because I, you know, always say, I wish I had those wonderful stories of cooking in the kitchen with my mother and grandmother, but mm-hmm. I don't. <sighs> um, <laughs> my mother always wanted me to focus on studying and, yeah. but, you know, being a student and having a career, you know, I, so I worked with children. It was really ironic. Every, every population I work with, I made sure the kids cooked. Oh, yeah. I work with special needs preschoolers you know, three to five year olds that had a mixed bag of issues. And we cooked every Friday with those kids. We made something. And then I went on to work with hospitalized children at children's hospital. Uh, We figured out ways to cook there. And yeah, it it was always central to, and I was always learning, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as a newly married wife, I, you know, had maybe about four or five cookbooks and I read them religiously. And every time my husband bought me a new cookbook, I was just thrilled and would try everything out, tried to teach myself how to make pasta from scratch and, you know, all kind of, I was, I was very adventurous and this was like early to mid nineties. Oh yeah. And then our cable was, I think it was Comcast at that time was the only cable in Pittsburgh that carried the early, early, early food network. When they actually had 
cooking shows that you could learn something exactly. from. Exactly. They're, they're much exactly. fewer on that yes. type of yes. network now. So I, I could go down a rabbit hole about that. But um, <laughs> I won, but I started watching, and I'm talking Emerald early in the day when yeah. he was like camera shy and awkward and, yes. you know. And Food Network was a new concept. The only food shows you ever saw was like PBS on a right. Saturday. Right. You know, I religiously watched Great Chefs of the West for years, and that was about the only thing. <laughs> Yan King, Martin Yan, maybe, and uh, what's the Frugal Gourmet? There was yeah. just a few, you know, after Julia Child and uh, Graham yes. Carroll. Um, but I just started, you know, cooking along with Sarah Moulton and learning all, you know, just following all these chefs and learning pre social media, pre Facebook, all of that, but picking up cookbooks when I can't, could, and just teaching myself and taking classes locally at the crate. Oh, the crate is the cooking school over in uh, Green Tree. Green Tree, that's yes. right. Yes, they started out, they were first in um, like Scott Township, Mount Lebanon area at that time. But then I started, you know, I learned how to make pasta from them because my home attempt was a big fail. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, it, it just grew from there. Oh. So, so you're self-taught. Yes. For the most part, you know, I, I've taken classes along the way, but then um, life-changing circumstances, unfortunately mm -hmm. lost my husband yes. in 2006. I was fortunate to be able to just, just do some part-time work to keep my brain active and be there for my son. And that mm -hmm. was my biggest focus. Right. So he hits middle school, doesn't really need me that much anymore. You know, like, what am I going to do when I grow up? <laughs> And the thought of culinary school, oh my God, I don't know if I want to like work in a kitchen eight hours a day. I, <laughs> Look at know, me now. But <laughs> it, it actually has, it came across my mind in my yeah. late 30s to 40s, yeah. but I'm like, do I want to do that? I know, yeah. I know. And that's when the um, program in food studies was taking off at Chatham. Chatham University. Mm -hmm. And you have a, a master's of arts. A master's of arts, of arts in, and food studies yeah. Chat from Chatham. So I was part was, of 2015? I, I graduated in 2015. I started the program in 2011. I took a little bit longer because it was going super part-time being a mom, yeah. you know? So yeah, I um, just tried about everything I could to learn about the food system and the local food scene from you know, spending a summer at Churchview Farm. <laughs> oh yeah. If <laughs> and, folks don't know Churchview Farm, you should check it out. Their yes. farm dinners are amazing. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it, it was a family farm that's really been untouched by modern agriculture and this, you know, younger granddaughter of the immigrant family that that came there, took it over and just turned it into this amazing little oasis on top of a hill in, um, is it Baldwin Borough? I believe. Yeah. And it, it, they do really cool things there. She grows what, like 20 varieties of or 40 varieties of tomatoes. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It is. And everything else and goats and chicken, you know, <laughs> and a couple of really nice dogs. And yeah, cats. yeah. 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 Absolutely. Uh, it is up in Baldwin. I yes. was trying to think too, because you feel like you're still in the city, but mm -hmm. you make a couple turns and you are on the farm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Up to gravel road. I mean, yeah. I haven't been for a while, but the last time, yeah. But I um, started leading food tours, walking food tours in the city for a company called Burke Bits and Bites. Oh, wow. Locally. I did that for 11 years. It just let's take a sidestep here. Okay. Tell me a little bit about a, a food tour. Like what were like one or two of the neighborhoods you would go? Um, so they're still touring at this point in Lawrenceville, the mm -hmm. Strip District, which of course is of course the most the strip, popular. Yeah. I helped develop tours both in Saxonburg and mm. Allentown. Now, the Allentown tour is no longer live, sadly. But I also, uh, there's one on the north side and south side. Okay. Uh, and then one of, probably one of my favorite is the uh, Brookline tour. Oh, yeah. Tapita Land. And, I you love know, Brookline. yeah, it's, it's a great little mm -hmm. tour. So, yeah, I had to pull back from that because I've just become too busy with the bakery. But it was great fun. We would meet. People buy tickets online or sometimes it's a private group and we would meet at the first stop on the tour and and gather and get to know each other and then explore six to seven businesses within the neighborhood. Now, it's not always a restaurant. It could be an ethnic food store, you know, uh -huh. it could be a, a formal spot or a more casual spot, but um, it's great fun. And we always try to mix in the history of the neighborhood and maybe something non-food, like for example, the Lawrenceville tour, we stop in a great art gallery. Oh, um, yeah. In the strip, we start at St. Patrick's Church, which has a fabulous history and a beautiful inside, and very unique. It's groups of 12 and by the end, people are you know breaking bread together and having a great time and just connecting with the owners and with the guides. It's great fun. I just think for you, I mean, 
number one, you started sort of being book smart about learning how to mm-hmm. code. Mm-hmm. And there, now you've transitioned into really not only this this degree at Chatham, but I would think that you learned so much as a docent for one of these tours. Absolutely. I, like, mm-hmm. Are there any relationships you've developed with some of the store owners, the proprietors oh, uh, that really stand out? Yes. Oh, ab- absolutely. Um, one of the biggest, and this was going on prior w- with the strip. I again, since I did it for eleven years, I've probably led that tour hundred, literally hundreds of, of times. times. Just love, love, love the people at Parma Sausage. Mm-hmm. Um, was super thrilled when I was working on another project when Rena, the um, daughter of the original proprietor, took me up into her office and we ate prosciutto and cheese and bread and some of her homemade bread. And I had already always seen her dad doing that on mm-hmm. the Rick Seaback Strip District special. Yeah. And sadly, he had passed by the time I was leading tours. So I just felt this full circle moment yes. that I wanted. Yeah. Um, and also in the strip, the people at Enrico Biscotti um, mm-hmm. are just like family. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Especially, you know, we, we miss Larry so much. And that was a hard one. <laughs> yes. But yeah, in Stimolis, the, those ladies are lovely. And their dad, you know, they're taking over the store, the next generation of women taking yes. over Stimolis. Um, I've, I've met mm-hmm. both of his daughters. You know, I can, I can Connie, Connie, Connie and Ka- Katina. Katina. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. They've helped me out buying several cheeses now. For oh, them. yeah things yeah. that I was doing. Yeah. They're, they're Super fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I could go on and on, you know, quite a few in Lawrenceville as well. Yeah. Totally love, uh, a Franco and Annette. It's Senti, just wonderful people. Uh, yeah. Just, <laughs> well, that's, I think that's, I think what I'm fascinated with you, you are a food person in so many facets, but you actually, you really have the relationships with some of these folks. Mm-hmm. Not only do you know where to go, some of the key gems of the the city and the region. Yes, yes. But you know the people. Yeah. And you know their yeah. story. I'm sure you know you probably need to be thinking about that little book you need to write. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. It <laughs> that has come up several times. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, there are so many good stories. In fact, I wrote a really great little bio on Joe from Joe Shaheen from Peter from Land. Peter and Land. Like, oh, you know, I could just so He's great. The first yeah. time I went to Peter Land, Joe, the this is the father, the mm-hmm. founder of Peter Land, mm-hmm. who was sitting out on a bench. And I just, you had told me about him. So I asked him, like, are you Joe? And he just went in and oh, told sure. me the story. Oh, sure. It, it's, I, a it's a fabulous story. It's a fascinating story. <laughs> and a fabulous family story, mm-hmm. an immigrant story. And and what they do with PETA, not only locally, but really across the country. Sure. It's mm-hmm. an amazing operation. So a little bit, I'm just going to go off on a tangent here, but what drives me with this is my ancestors on my mother's side, uh, my great grandfather was a butcher and a oh, poultry wow. man and came here and opened a store on Penn Avenue. I love it. I had so, no idea. Yeah. So my mom would always say 1909 to 1913, which is now the big giant parking lot with mural. Oh. His business was so successful. They had three storefronts and lived above the store. Amazing. That's where my mother was born when they still lived there. And she said, you know, they were wholesalers because the strip was largely wholesale at yes. that point. Um, yes. And maybe some little corner grocery stores for the people who live there. But largely what we know now, you know, the businesses that were around there were largely wholesale. And they supplied um, grocery stores, little little grocery stores, because that's what existed. Right. <laughs> um, and hotels. Oh, yeah. Wow. I actually have photos of my grandmothers that I took to a Kodak photo machine and blew up and would bring those on the tour. Um, and I never knew these people. No. I don't know. I know very little. My mom's dad died when she was about 10. So, you know, that generation, you didn't talk about too much. There's some stories I've heard, but not a lot. Mm-hmm. So when I can do that for another family, I can preserve it through my writing or through telling stories to other people. And keep that alive, that memory alive that I personally lost. It's huge to me. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. You got me thinking too. So you are, your Mm -hmm. family's lifelong here in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Where where did you grow up? Forest Hills. Forest Hills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. although that oral history kind of sort of disappeared or got Mm -hmm. kind of thin, Mm -hmm. um, it was great. How did you find out? About those that was that was still surviving. Well, we talk a little bit, okay. you know. My mom would have stories like them, you know, butchering a chicken and it's still running around without a tail. Of course, and things like that, you know. And they were very prosperous, yeah. you know. So they were. She always said, even during the depression, people needed food. Yes, so of course, they were able to build. The family built two homes in Squirrel Hill, mm. one of which I would spend a lot of my childhood in because my great aunt, my 
grandfather's sister and her husband lived there. And the great grandmother, um, my grandfather's mom, lived with them. You mm-hmm. know, like the the matriarch of the family, who ironically, with a name like Matashevsky, she was German. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. she married a Polish guy. That wasn't done a lot back then. Yeah, but yeah, and um, then my grandfather, grandmother, and my parent or my my mom and her siblings all grew up on the other side of what is it, Browns Hill Road that goes down towards yeah. Um, they lived at sh- on the corner of Shady and Birchfield, and then my my mom lived on the other side. They had identical houses built by the same architect. They moved like Squirrel Hill was kind of countryish at that yes, point, at you time. know. Mm-hmm. You know, then we moved further out to Forest Hills. We all stayed east and then kept moving mm-hmm. out. That sounds but like yeah. at the time Forest Hills probably sounded so far away. Oh from Pittsburgh. yeah, yeah. And oh sure, really yeah. It it, it was. And the pictures of my parents built the home under construction or bought it under construction, construction. in the fifties. The photos of the front porch; those homes weren't even there. Oh, Just that gosh. valley behind. Yeah, I'll have to show wow. you sometime. Yeah. So really deep. Pittsburgh roots. Yes, I love that. super deep, super deep. Okay, so let's kind of come back to some more present day. So I love this this way that you're sharing history with the food tours. I would love to talk a little bit more about when you got into your uh, education at Chatham mm-hmm. and some of the connections you've now made that have brought you to today. Is that where the cookbook club came out of or are those unrelated? Um, yes, it is related because our food studies... Food writing teacher at that time was Sherry Flick, who's a local writer. She writes a lot of short stories, fiction, flash fiction, that kind of thing. But she took on the food studies course. She had been doing like blogging neighborhood walking food tours. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and the uh, the head of the of the Chatham department honed in on her and had her teach this course. So I I took that, loved it. And she really empowered us. She said, you know, any of you could some submit something, you know, and I had a connection through somebody else at Chatham to Bob Batts Jr., who was the um, editor of the PG's food mm-hmm. section at that time. And I sent him a couple writing samples and pitched him a couple ideas. And he's like, here, go with this. I'm like, okay. So, you know, so, that. So you've had some freelance articles yes. published in mm-hmm. the, Pits- in the Post-Gazette, the Post-Gazette. Um, Craft Pittsburgh Beer Magazine. I wrote for quite regularly. A couple other outlets here, local Pittsburgh. The other oh some national I wrote an article about food and grief for a um, grief publication Aww. a little bit here and there so Sherry back to the connection through the cookbook thing Sherry has this online community on Facebook that she invited students to belong to and there are literally hundreds of people on this in this community from all over the world we you know we share pictures recipes we talk about food you know subjects etc. So, and we can invite other people to join it. You know, throughout their years ago, there was an article about starting a cookbook club. Two other people picked it up and we started, it was just three of us for a while. We started this little cookbook club. So we would meet every four to six weeks and all cook from the same book and talk about it and meet together. So it's still going strong. A lot of people have come and gone. There's probably about eight to 10 regular members at this point, but okay. it's still, we have a really good time with it. But yeah, that's and how I met Erica. I was going to say, yeah. this is how you met one of your business <laughs> yes, partners, that's our how friend I met Erica. Erica Bruce. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then Erica was a maker in residence for Chatham. And so was Chloe Newman. My and and what does that mean? If, so, if one of our listeners doesn't know oh. what a maker in residence oh, is. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, that means that they have been uh, contracted by the university for, I'm not sure if it's a semester or a, a year to share their knowledge and expertise by conducting workshops and classes and then, you know, in turn, gaining a lot of knowledge from the school. So you met Erica through Cookbook Club, who yes. coincidentally was doing this maker in residence at yes. Chatham. Mm-hmm. And coincidentally, your third current business partner, Chloe Newman, was also doing a maker in residence. Yes. Yes. And they both had, you know, uh, their own business Baking businesses. Okay. Chloe's was crustworthy, doing all types of wonderful things with sourdough. Mm. And Erica's was Le Beau Gâteau, doing cakes and a lot of French pastry, brunch items, etc. So they um, met at Chatham and also were side by side at a local farmer's market. Oh, So leading up to, we'll, we'll kind of come back to the bakery mm-hmm. at the end, but like your orbits were mm-hmm. sort of... Uh, coming together yes. a, a little while back. Yes. Oh, well, I love it. Really funny. I went to the IACP conference, uh, the 
um, International Association for Culinary Professionals. It was held in Pittsburgh a couple years back. Eating lunch, and this lovely young woman comes and sits next to me, and she introduces herself, and it was Chloe. Huh. And I said, oh, we have a mutual friend, Erica Bruce. Somebody from Milk Street, not Milk Street, but um, Cook's Country. Cook's Country. Came and sat down next to us and said, oh, Erica Bruce, I know her. So, oh. you know, we, that's how I fe- first met Chloe was at that conference. Oh, you know? I love it. Yeah. We'll have to talk to those other two ladies on yes. a couple yes. future shows. I actually went to, I think, one of your cookbook club Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, I'm terrible. I I think let me let me throw my dirty little secret out. I love cookbooks, but I don't usually cook out of them very much. (laughs) I look through them, I get really inspired, and then I go do my own thing. I'm too much of a fiddler, and you are much better at at least trying. I'll try it. I'll try it. Yeah, I, I'm a fiddler too, though. Yeah. A woman I used to work with said, can't you ever leave a recipe alone? I'm no. like, you really can't. But for the sake of the club, I usually try to stay true to form for, mm-hmm. for that occasion. And we all do, and we talk about it. You it's know, a great so. community. I also remember when we did meet up for that club, you give each other feedback. Like oh, if yeah. something worked oh, or yeah. didn't work. <laughs> Technique wise, you yes, got, you are do. not afraid to say mm, that was a little dry, or no, sure, <laughs> or no, I maybe do this no. next time. I mean, it, there's a couple pastry chefs in the group. Mm-hmm. There's um, a lot of us are just self taught home cooks. Mm-hmm. There's an academic scholar who who a lot of her PhD work was around cookbooks. So I mean, there's it's a tough crowd, but oh, I love it. Yeah, we all go home with leftovers. Mm-hmm. It, it was actually just last night, and my refrigerator is full for the week right now with all the That's good stuff. Probably one of the best sort of food shares you could do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's great fun. I have a couple other little factoids I'd love to to talk through. You had another interesting event with the food critic of the LA and New York Times, Ruth Reichel, who is a, a food writer. Yes. Uh, tell yes. me about that story again, because I know that was one of those other food moments. You're like, oh how is gosh. this happening? Yes. I I have Ruth Reichel's work early on reading food, you know, food lit genre was right at the a saving thing for me, right when my husband was diagnosed with his illness. Mm-hmm. I discovered her books the uh, under the Tuscan sun. And I'm like, oh, they were just like these little escapes from the reality. I take my son as a toddler up to the library and just try to get every book like that I could get my hands on mm-hmm. and started reading her work and then, and everything she did over the years, just loved her. I, I saw her at the Carnegie lecture series one time when she was in town and got her autograph. But a friend of mine locally who is the editor for the off-duty section of the Wall Street Journal. She works here out of Pittsburgh. Her name oh. is Beth Cracklauer. Okay. She has an amazing food-related pedigree, and she worked at one one point for Gourmet Magazine oh. under Ruth. So she posted on Facebook, hey, does anyone want to join me at the farm? It was this weekend at Ian Knauer, who was a, a executive chef for Gourmet Magazine, at his farm and cooking school out there around New Hope and quaint little gorgeous towns. Yes. And they were having a get together of the old the old band from Gourmet, oh, magazine, from Gourmet magazine to um commemorate, I wouldn't say celebrate but commemorate the demise. It was been 10 years since they had shuttered their doors. Mm-hmm. And of course, the big name attraction was um Ruth and it happened to be the same fall as what would have been my 25th wedding anniversary and I'm like, oh, oh you know, people get these great trips and jewelry and everything else. I'm treating myself to this. So I went out the first morning when she walked in the door to have this access to her for over 48 hours and hear her talk. And it was just, and I got, I had some one-on-one time with her when I had her sign a book and it was just lovely. And I I told her the story of how the writing helped me so much, you know, and she's, yeah, was so gracious and lovely and told me a related story about something in her life. And Oh, you know, <laughs> it was, yeah, but they, they were cooking demonstrations. We ate together. They roasted a, you know, half of a pig in, in Ian's outdoor wood fire oven and all kinds of amazing. There's a great little fig community out there, you know, wine people, cookbook people, restaurant people, farmers that are really, you know, I still follow to this day. Number one, such an incredible story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and number two, I even think the way that I feel about meeting you and Erica and then other people in the food community that mm-hmm. I know, uh, the people are just people. Sure. Even if they're big names mm-hmm. in the food world, whether mm-hmm. that's Gourmet Magazine or something here in Pittsburgh. And 
everyone's so welcoming. Yes. And they share a lot more Mm -hmm. than maybe what we initially expect. Absolutely. And I love that. I mean, it's not only that the food brings us together, but then it's really the people that's the main focus. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Sure. I think food people are just, it's kind of innate, you know, (laughs) it's kind of a nurturing. We like to feed people. We like to connect with people through the food and conversation. One more uh, moment that you and I had was with our friend, Chris Fenimore. Oh. Yeah, and <laughs> I had never been. Uh, this is technically the first time I had ever been on TV. Mm-hmm. Period. Mm-hmm. So you and I had done the kids camp together. Chris Fenimore of WQED's QED Cooks mm-hmm. or America's Home Cooking, depending on how they're marketing their show, local or national. He's just someone I've watched for so oh, long. Sure. Yeah, I grew up mm-hmm. with Chris, and uh, he came to camp. And he did his demo. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was the- he did the turkey Devonshire because we were doing regional American foods that that's year. Right. So we, and we made p- strawberry pretzel salad. That's <laughs> yeah. right. Oh, that's yeah. so great! And then he just hung out. Sure. And I was making something with the kids that I had never made before. I think mm-hmm. it was a strudel or something. Uh, he came over to my table with the kids and he just kept watching, and I was mm-hmm. so nervous. And oh my I don't gosh, think we we're making no. something like a is it knish. Maybe, and he's maybe. like, I've never seen one like that, and I'm from Brooklyn, and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> but after that, we saw him a couple more times, mm-hmm. and it turned out they were doing another new show uh, at our local PBS station, mm-hmm. and we both got to yeah, take we part were both on that. again. It was fun just to be behind the scenes, sure, sure. And then and the kitchen's so small, you're not <laughs> on TV, you don't realize you it, you don't yeah. <laughs> realize it, and that all of a sudden there's 20 people there for the taping day, mm-hmm. and he asked both you and I. Sort of in a lovely way, last minute Mm -hmm. to be on this show. I think. Oh, I was super last minute that day, if you remember. (laughs) But it makes it more fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. uh, I think that we're so lucky in the Pittsburgh region to have locally based food programming. Mm -hmm. There's Mm -hmm. so many cities that don't have anything like that. No. And well, he was a pioneer. I mean, he was Mm -hmm. doing that. Probably around when Food Network was in its yes. nascent stages, you know. Like, uh, what is really great is he celebrates the region he and does. the people so and much. People. Yeah. My it's- first encounter with him with Chris was I met him at an event at Chatham. Somebody for their thesis project was doing a version of Iron Chef. Oh my with goodness! Chatham Food Study students versus their uh, cafeteria staff, their food service staff. So we did, you know, we had. Items from a CSA and we had to make some, we kind of knew ahead. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, but he was one of the judges. He and Larry, like a tutor and somebody else I can't remember, but he, my son came, oh. I, I took him out of school that day. I said, you know, I don't really have a job for take your child to work day. Can I take him out and excused apps? And he came and he was taking pictures and run, running around and cheering. He was maybe 12 or 13 at oh. the time and super excited. A young Teddy. Yeah. A young Teddy. <laughs> and Chris came to me afterwards and said, Hey, you know, do you and your son cook together? I said all the time. He goes, would you consider being on the show? Oh, so I, I sent him a letter and I want to say it was probably 24. 14, we were on the holiday sides, That's which right. shows again every year at, at Thanksgiving, Christmas time, you know, so it's funny. And what did you make on that? Oh, uh, we made, it was a crowd pleaser. We made something called pumpkin dumplings. Pumpkin dumplings. So it was, it's a nice, it was originally from Bon Appetit magazine. I took the recipe and tweaked it a little bit, but, um, you know, it was like a drop batter, little dumplings, and I would do a brown butter sage Parmesan sauce over top of it. So it's a oh, great side dish for lovely. Thanksgiving or for a ham. It's fabulous, you yeah. know, but they're they're delicious. We enjoy them. So I still get people asking me for it. I will to have to ask day. you yeah. for that recipe. Yeah, I do have it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <good. laughs> All right. Well, let's move forward too. So coming back to the bakery and okay. your business partners, mm-hmm. you're sort of serving as a third arm to this cooperative, as you all call mm-hmm. it. You each have your mm-hmm. your roles and maybe even looking for more partners. But the yes. third space bakery is going to be a community space with like an educational kitchen mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. learning events Teaching at kitchen night. or yes. Teaching mm-hmm. kitchen. And so you're heading up that part yes. of the mm-hmm. bakery. So tell us a little bit more sort of your, your aspects of that happening and any other goals you have. Okay. Yeah. Well, we, um, you know, figured... Eric and I so enjoyed working together and running the camp. And there are a number of fantastic teaching kitchens around the city, but you look at their calendars, sold out, sold out, sold out, you know? So we figured that there was room for us in that landscape. And we 
went ahead with it. And we also crunching the numbers and writing our business plan. It was a great way to use the space at night, yes. great revenue stream and to get different people in mm -hmm. to the space. So we will offer a lot of basic baking classes, of course, because we're a bakery. Chloe already has been teaching sourdough workshops for years and has that curriculum down. And she's a fantastic teacher. Mm -hmm. Go home with some starter and all the, you know, directions you'll need to make your sourdough and, um, I need to sneak into one of those. Yeah, you have to come to one of those. <laughs> and um, Erica, of course, has been teaching for ages on TV and off of TV. And you can teach anything baking, cooking as well. And I've done a lot of cooking, basic skills like knife skills or how to cook from your pantry or cookbook theme classes for kids and adults as well. So eventually we'll probably do something for children. Right now we're just kind of easing into it with the staff that we have and, and some other friends <laughs> um, cooking, cooking with us. And, you know, we'll, we're starting out right now with one class a week and maybe one, one or two weekends classes a nice. month. And we're going to keep growing from there. The other thing is too, that we can use the space for events. Uh, can I talk about our architect? You can talk about the architect. <laughs> yes. Okay. Our, our architect, Greg Weimerskirch. Who people may not know, uh, who are listeners, Greg's my husband. Okay. <laughs> so Greg designed this fabulous space with kind of modular counters that will are, that are on wheels that lock and serve as our counter space during the day, display mm -hmm. space, but we'll flip around and they can, they're counter height, so they can be our little stations for groups for cooking for teaching classes, but we can also rearrange it if we wanted to have a chef's dinner, like a demo dinner, or if we wanted yeah. to have uh, uh, some type of party. And, and mm -hmm. I, I'm actually redoing our first interactive party for a pick grab oh. at the end of April. So um, there'll be some hands-on that the guests can participate in making breakfast rolls for the next day to take home and they're going to be making pizzas for everybody to eat and salads, et cetera. So we can, it's really adaptive. Plus we have that fabulous deck space. Yes. And you know, when we're not in production, we can open those garage doors and spill it all onto that deck in nice weather. So we envision really finding creative ways to using that Very adaptive space. and mm -hmm. transformative for the space. Yes. And it's, so it's not just a bakery. Yes. Yeah. yes. And not to say that that would be bad. No, <laughs> no, but you know, like our friend Chris Fenimore said, he said, there's nothing else like it. So no, there really yeah. is nothing else like it. I'm so yeah. excited. Yeah. So why don't you take a moment and plug all of the names and the, the places people can go to, to learn more about your business? We are on Instagram at Third Space PGH. We are on Facebook, Third Space Bakery, thirdspacebakery.com. And I would, I know people don't like to get a lot of emails, but Everyone wants to know what we're baking, what we're serving, or when we're going to open. I write a weekly email that you get Monday or Tuesday that will give you the, that information. Sign up for yeah, it. Yeah, sign up you for it. It has our goods. yeah, it has our live menu. You also find us at the Bloomfield Farmers Market, and we will mm -hmm. be continuing that. Uh, winter market is over. Summer starts first week in May, so and we will be there for that. So, for any of our listeners that aren't familiar but want to check out the Bloomfield Market over in the Bloomfield neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's Bloomfield PGH also on Instagram. Check out all their hours and their times. Yes. They they do both the winter market and then mm -hmm. the summer market. Absolutely. Yeah. And the summer market's fantastic. A huge amount of vendors. I, I mean, love it. Yeah, it's great. And I would highly suggest if you are a fan of our product to pre-order because yes. we run out. <laughs> you run we, out. We get people coming and that are disappointed that they didn't get their house loaf for their specialty yeah. loaf for their cookies that they like. But it, you can pre-order and just pick it up already bagged and ready to go. All the more reason you need that email newsletter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Beth, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. It's been, it's been such a, a pleasure. Pleasure's all mine. <laughs> Beth, there's always a question I ask at the end for all of our listeners. Mm -hmm. The name of the show is The Pittsburgh Dish. Yes. What is one of the best dishes you've eaten this week? I would say last night at Cookbook Club, we cooked from a book called Walks of Life. Okay. A Chinese family that have written this cookbook. It's fantastic. Uh, and Anna would not agree with me, but the Dan Dan noodles that she made were fantastic. Ooh, I love Dan Dan noodles. <laughs> they were very good. Yeah. Yeah. So the best thing you ate this week, out of cookbook club, that couldn't be any better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Beth. You're welcome. Thank you. We recorded our interview with Beth Kurtz Taylor a few weeks back and wanted to provide an update that Third Space Bakery is now open. They're located in the Garfield neighborhood of Pittsburgh. 
Go ahead, give them a visit and support an amazing women-owned business. Looking for that special place for the meat lover in your life? We have it next in the Weekly Recommend. Hey, so we're back with our friend Raquel Holiday, And Raquel, I know uh, when we've talked in the past, you often like what you call the, the bougie experience <laughs> restaurant. I was just wondering if, if you could give us a recommendation of some place you've been lately that really uh, fit the bill for that category with you. Okay. So if you are a meat eater or if you have a meat aficionado in your family, there is a restaurant that is very aptly named Meat and Potatoes. Oh, yeah. Down, um, in, the, down in the cultural district oh, yeah. downtown oh, yeah. Pittsburgh. Yes. Downtown. I got the most insane steak and it was a 50 ounce tomahawk. Wait, I think I saw a picture of this. Looked incredible. And it is just as massive as you <laughs> could imagine. And like, we didn't just stop there. We got tuna tartare, house rolls, a duck breast. We got French fries. We got glazed carrots, which the glazed carrots, if you're ever there, are a 10 out of 10. Oh my. And then the 50 ounce tomahawk. And then we also got dessert. We got some coconut cream cake for dessert. And honestly, I do not regret a single <laughs> bite of food, the single bit of meat sweats that I had after, <laughs> or I also don't regret the fact that I had a very small amount of leftovers, like way less than what you would have thought we would have had after that meal. How many folks were at the table? There was two of us. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would recommend maybe ordering that for like three or more. Right, um, yeah. But me and my friend were champs. Like we had so little leftovers. Doug, I'll show you like after this, how little leftovers there was. <laughs> because it was so good. It was so good and worth every penny. Like uh, you might think like, oh my God, this Tomahawk steak costs $150. Worth it. <laughs> so good. Great experience. Um, I don't have any animals, but apparently like the bone, since it's gigantic, like you could probably like give to your dog to gnaw mm. on or something like that. Yes. Doug, you have to go. Like, uh, obviously this is not a, just a dinner you get any night of the week. When you're looking to up the game, treat yourself or someone else you love, this is where you're taking it. This is where you should go if you have someone who loves steak. And especially if it's someone that I feel like with a lot of like more expensive restaurants, they go into items that might not be approachable for everyone. Mm. And I know a lot of girls out there or just anyone in a relationship, they might have a partner that's like just a very meat and potatoes type of person, mm -hmm. right? And I feel like this is an item that you can get that can still wow, but also just it's everything. Like, I, I, <laughs> I mean, I have no intentions in the near future of eating this item again, but like six months from now, it's going to come down to craving it. So, <laughs> so this was a food experience that you will continue to remember. And I will get it again. Just maybe not for another couple months. Gotcha. So meat and potatoes. 50 ounce tomahawk. Downtown Pittsburgh. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much, Raquel. You can follow Raquel Holiday at Fork Yeah PGH on Instagram. Okay, full disclosure, this week's recipe comes from a relative of mine, Aunt Jane, and it's her five cup salad. And in true Pittsburgh form, this salad has no lettuce whatsoever. In fact, it's more of a sweet, almost dessert. It's just five ingredients, which includes, of course, mini marshmallows, pineapple chunks, shredded coconut, mandarin oranges, and sour cream. And you got it. It's a cup of each. Let's go ahead and give my Aunt Jane a call and learn a little bit more about this recipe. Hi, dear. Hi, Aunt Jane. How are you? Fine. It's so good to hear from you. Oh, you too. So I wanted to know a little bit more about five cup salad. Where did you get that recipe? Oh, Mama made that. Oh, yeah? She probably got it from, you know, church or the teacher. I don't know. Oh, wait. You know what? I think it was Ibby Heilman, uh -huh. who had been Daddy's cousin. And then she and Mama both were teachers. That's so funny. It's so simple, but, you know, it's probably at the time it had coconut and pineapple and mandarin. Oh, yeah. Or maybe the, yeah. I'm thinking maybe the 50s would be more accurate. Yeah. Back then, all that salad stuff was hot. Right. They were probably swapping recipes all the time. Yes. Well, you know what? We always had get togethers and picnics and we visited back and forth. So whenever somebody was coming, you made sandwiches and a salad and dessert and 
you had like a jello salad or maybe five cup salad, you mm. know, as a, something to go along with your sandwich. Right. That was not the dessert though. No, it's a side dish, right? Uh-uh. It was a side dish. Right. <laughs> I love it. Mm-hmm. Well, this is great. Yeah. Well, Aunt Jane, thanks so much for sharing a little bit more about this recipe, and thanks for being on the Pittsburgh Dish. Well, thank you, dear. It's my pleasure. Aww. We love listening to you. Aww. Have a good day. Aw, you too. Love you both. Love you too. Bye-bye. Well, that's our show for this week. We want to thank all of our guests and contributors, and to Kevin Selecki of Carnegie Accordion Company for providing the music to our show. We'll be back again next week with another fresh episode. Stay tuned.